Well, good evening. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. And thank you for joining us tonight uh, for this next episode of Wonderful Words of Life. We are continuing to look at the wonderful statements the Lord Jesus made while he was here. And the amazing thing is that they're still very relevant uh, to us today. The title of uh, tonight's episode is RSVP. Now, I know that you remember from your school days, I'm sure, that this stands for Responde s'il vous plaît. And it's French, the, the translation, I suppose, is please reply. And so when you get a, uh, an invitation to maybe a wedding or a function and you see these letters at the bottom, then it's alerting you to the fact that you need to make some kind of response. We're going to think tonight about one of the greatest invitations in the universe, an invitation made by the Lord Jesus. And at the bottom of the invitation, there is an RSVP. So we're going to have to think about the invitation tonight and think about a response, because a response is demanded. The invitation is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. I'm sure it's familiar to most people. And the Lord Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is surely one of the sweetest invitations ever given. It is really a gem. And like so many gems, it shows off against a really dark background. If you read Matthew chapter 11, you'll find it's a dark background. The Lord Jesus, the Bible says he's upbraiding the cities where most of his mighty works were done because they didn't believe in him. And so he mentions Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida. And he says again and again, woe unto thee, woe unto thee. In other words, he's pronouncing and alerting them to the fact that because of their rejection of him, they face a future of judgment. It's a very gloomy chapter. But then right at the end, it's lovely that the Lord Jesus ends this chapter of darkness with this wonderful scintillating gem as he holds out, I, I imagine him at least, holding out his arms and extending again, as he had done so many times, the great gospel invitation, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a favorite verse of gospel preachers, and no wonder. I suppose we could look at it in so many ways. We could think of its simplicity. Come, even a young child understands that. We could think of its sincerity. How often perhaps you have an invitation, but you can tell that it's just not a very sincere invitation. Perhaps the person inviting you would be surprised if you actually took them seriously and took up the invitation. But here is an invitation given with such sincerity. And so we could think of its simplicity, its sincerity, we think of its scope, because the Lord Jesus addresses this invitation to all who are weary and heavy laden. And so what a wide scope it has. But tonight, I want to focus on the last statement of the invitation. It's really a, a promise that is contained in this invitation, that if you come to the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus says himself, I will give you rest. What a wonderful promise that is. What a wonderful statement. And so the Lord Jesus, as I imagine him with real longing in his voice, uh, would perhaps extend his arms to the crowd who are, who are, who are milling around and who are, who are listening to his words. And he would say, after he's pronounced all these uh, judgments against the cities that rejected him, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I want to think about this idea of rest. What is it the Lord Jesus actually meant when he said, I will give you rest? Well, this idea is spoken of, the idea of rest is spoken of in two ways in the Bible. First of all, it's the common idea, I suppose, of what we would say is relief from labor and exhaustion. And so the idea is, is pretty plain and simple, that here is somebody who is exhausted, who's expended their energy. It's been a day of laborious toil, and at the end of it, they're just glad to sit down and to be able to rest. And it's, it's the, the rest of relief, perhaps from heavy labor. It's the relief of laying down a heavy burden and 
evidently that's what the Lord Jesus meant in this verse primarily because he speaks about those who labor and are heavy laden. And so he's talking about people who are exhausted with their labor and have got a tremendously heavy burden that is crushing them down. And the Lord Jesus says, if you come to me, I will deal with your burden. I'll take it from you and I will give you rest and relief. Well, that's something that is very precious. But the Lord Jesus is not talking here about physical rest. He's talking about spiritual rest. He's talking about rest from the burden of sin. And we're going to think about that for a few minutes. This idea of relief from heavy labor or a really heavy burden. Well, guilt is a tremendous burden that many people bear. Most of us will look back on our lives and there are things that we regret and there are things that we would rather forget, but we can't. And there are people whose lives uh, are dominated by feelings of guilt about the past and they're quite proper and right. We wouldn't dismiss these because the Bible very clearly says that we're all guilty before God. It's quite right that we acknowledge and feel our guilt. The Bible is not in the business of just sweeping everything under the carpet and pretending that everything is okay. Each one of us, everyone listening to me tonight, including the speaker, we all have a guilty past. We've all sinned against God. And that can become such a tremendously heavy burden. You'll have read the books of Charles Dickens, his last book. In fact, he died before it was finished, it was incomplete. It was the mystery of Edwin Drood. And it's quite a dark book, really, uh, because it details a man who committed a dreadful crime. He committed the crime of murder. And it seemed that he got away with it. But the whole book is about how that, although it seemed like the perfect crime and nobody could ever find out what, was, what had happened, nevertheless, the burden of guilt was such that it actually crushed the man. And eventually the whole thing came out. But the burden of, of guilt drove this man uh, mad almost. And dear friends, that is very real. In our society, many people have got psychological problems, have got difficulties because of the burden of guilt. And each one of us, as I've said, we've all got a guilty past. The Lord Jesus says, if you come to me, if you respond, and here he is holding out his arms, as it were, he's, he's asking you to come to him. And he says, if you come to me, I'll deal with the burden of your guilt. Now, that's wonderful. What a rest that is to know that my guilty past is gone. It's been forgiven. I've been justified. That's what the Lord Jesus offers when he says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Well, the power of sin, not just the guilt of sin, but the power of sin is a tremendous bondage, a tremendous burden. People find that there are habits that develop in their lives and they are powerless to break them. They're powerless to change. And sometimes, of course, we don't want to change because we're enjoying ourselves and uh, it's great fun. And so we don't mind and we don't even notice that sin has a, has a dominion, has a domination in our lives. In fact, the Lord Jesus said, whoever practices, habitually pr practices sin, he is the slave of sin. And you know, there's been a, an advert going around. I've come up against it a few times on the internet and so on. It's one of the betting companies. I don't bet, just for the record. But uh, it's one of the betting companies. And what, one of the, one of the uh, phrases it uses is this. When the fun stops, stop. When the fun stops, stop. You know, it's a pretty pathetic, it's a pretty pathetic phrase because most people find that when the fun stops, they can't stop. That's the whole problem. They just can't stop. And so people are addicted to various things and sin has a, a domination on the lives of people because once we give ourselves to sin and we don't even know it until we try to break free. It's like children playing in an empty house. It's great fun. And then somebody goes and locks the door and they realize they can't get out. And then suddenly the fun stops. But it's so difficult when the fun stops to stop your way of life because sin has a dominion. Well, the Lord Jesus says, come to me. I'll give you rest, not just from the guilt of sin, I'll give you rest from the power and the dominion of sin. And the Bible says about Christians, those who believe in the Lord Jesus, sin shall not have dominion over you. But then there's the, the dread of future judgment. That's a tremendous burden for many people. And although we try to dress up death 
uh, nowadays and we, we, we have favourite pop songs when someone dies and we make it a celebration and we tell funny stories, people do anyway, tell funny stories and jokes at the burial, but we can't mask the fact, the Bible says, as appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And if we even think about it for a moment, if we allow ourselves to think about the fact that our sins deserve the judgment of God, then it becomes a burden. It becomes a weight. The Lord Jesus says, come to me. I'll get rid of that burden too. I can deal with that burden. I can give you rest. I can give you relief from guilt, from the power of sin, from the dread of future judgment. And there's something else here just before I leave this point. There is something else here as well. The Lord Jesus is perhaps addressing those who have been trying for years to make themselves right with God. They've been trying to make themselves uh, to comply with God's requirements and what a struggle it is and what a fruitless task it is and what a hopeless task it is because nobody can do it. And maybe you've tried it. Maybe you've tried to live a good life, tried to keep the Ten Commandments. I'll tell you, dear friend, the more you try, the more you'll discover it's like a bondage because you just can't do it. You just keep breaking it all the time. And eventually, the Apostle Paul says that when somebody's trying to do this, uh, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. I really i am disgusted with myself because it's such a, a trouble and a weariness and an exhausting thing. And I just can't do it to make myself right with God, to keep God's law. The Lord Jesus says, don't even try. Come to me and I'll give you rest. I wonder, can I ask you, dear friends, have you got that rest? There's nothing like it. There's nothing like being free from guilt. There's nothing like being free from the power of sin. There's nothing like being free from the dread of judgment. There's nothing like being able to give up every attempt to make yourself suitable for God and fit for heaven and just come to the Lord Jesus. He says, I will give you rest. That's wonderful. But let me just finish by saying this. There's another meaning in the Bible to this word rest. And if we go back right to the beginning of the Bible, we'll find in Genesis chapter 2, it says that after God had made the heavens and the earth, and in six days he made the entire universe, and it says on the seventh day God rested. God rested. Now, we mustn't think for a minute that this has anything to do with exhaustion. This is nothing like the first rest we've been talking about. This is not the idea. If we believe in a God at all, a God of infinite power, even the creation of the vast universe with all its complexity and all its powers, even that could not in any way exhaust or sap the strength of the Almighty. It's, it's ludicrous even to think that way. Certainly, we must understand this, that when God rested on the seventh day, he was not tired. He was not exhausted in any way. The idea is that God rested in the sense of being satisfied, of being content. The old preachers used to use the word complacent. In the best sense of the word, we use complacent in a bad sense. But when God rests and he is complacent, it simply means this, that he is satisfied in what he has done. He's satisfied in the work of creation. And as it were, on the seventh day, as God surveyed all that he'd done, he, as it were, stood back, if I can say this, and he was content. He was satisfied in a perfect work. Dear friends, this is wonderful. The Lord Jesus says to me, and he says to you today, come to me and find your rest and your satisfaction and your contentment, not in what you can do, but in what I have done. You know, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, God was entirely satisfied with what he did. And somebody has said this, as his body rested in the grave, you could almost say that God rested in heaven. He was delighted. He was satisfied with the price that had been paid. And he showed he was satisfied by raising his son from the dead. The resurrection is the proof that God rested on the work of Christ and was satisfied and content with what the Lord Jesus did. And you know, dear friends, when someone is converted, when they become a Christian, when they come to the Lord Jesus, they just rest as well. They just rest on where God rests. They rest on the work of Christ, on what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. When I realize that I come to him in faith, that it's not what I can do, not what these hands can do. It's not what I can be in the future or anything I can do in the past. 
It is simply resting and being content and sitting down in the work of Christ and saying, God is satisfied with this. I'm satisfied too. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die for sinners on the cross. And I'm going to complete the work to such a perfect condition and state that the entire universe can rest in it. Are you resting in it? Are you trusting in the Savior? Well, here is the wonderful invitation. You come to him by faith. You come individually. You come personally. You come definitely by believing on the Lord Jesus. And you find this, that when I come as a sinner and confess my sin and trust him to save me, I find he gives me rest. That's a wonderful thing. Well, respond to s'il vous plaît. RSVP. You know, can you imagine if you had invited somebody to some function that you were holding or arranging and there was no response? Well, you might think to begin with, perhaps they didn't get the invitation, so you maybe send another invitation. Still no response. You think, I better make sure of this. Maybe I've got the wrong address. So you go around, you knock on the door, you hand the invitation personally. There's no question now that they've got the invitation. And uh, there's still no response. And you wait a bit longer and there's still no response. And you maybe think, well, maybe they've got the invitation, but they don't understand the invitation. So, so I'll, I'll ring them up and explain exactly what's happening and, and what they're being invited to. And so you do that. And you explain to them and say, now, any questions you've got about this invitation, let me know. And you wait. And there's still no response. I, I want to ask you, how long would you wait, do you think? I don't think, you'd be, I don't think you'd be sending them a fourth or a fifth invitation. I think you would get the message very quickly. These people just don't want to come. They just don't want to come. I'm wasting my time. Dear friends, I'm glad that God doesn't approach the gospel invitation like that. He's invited you so many times. And maybe you've got the message. And maybe you understand the message. But you've never responded. You've never come to Christ. You've never believed in him. And uh, if I can say this reverently, one day the invitation is going to be rescinded. One day is going to be too late for you to respond at all. And as we close this meeting now in prayer, I'm going to invite you to respond to God's great invitation, to the words of Christ. Here he stands and he invites you and he invites you if you feel the burden of your sin and your guilt and the fear of judgment. And if you're tired of trying to please God and if you think it depends on yourself, come to him and rest on him and trust in him. And you can do it now. You can do it as we close in prayer. RSVP, a response is required. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we give thanks for this wonderful invitation. We think of how gracious the Lord Jesus was, despite the rejection of so many. We give thanks that still the invitation rang out. And we wonder just how many people got up and came forward to him and accepted him and believed in him. And we just wonder as people listen to these words quoted again, will someone tonight perhaps respond in faith and come to Christ and find the rest that he alone can give. We pray for thy blessing now in his precious name. Amen.